It is the Anfield Wrap. It's Neil Atkinson. We are here in association with Green King. 2024 is upon us, it says here, which is excellent news, given the fact that it means I'm writing the date round down correctly uh, when it comes to planning shows. It also means a packed schedule, it does, of FA Cup, AFCON, and, of course, Premier League action. Uh, you can beat the January Blues and watch every game of the atmosphere it deserves in your local Green King pub. You don't need to stream. If it's on the telly, it'll be on a Green King across the massive HD screens that they've got. And if you've got the app, it's 10% off every single drink whenever there is a game on uh, the venues offer uh, low and no alcohol a- options so you can have your January as dry or as wet as you want uh, <laughs> and you can settle uh, for you don't have to settle sorry for a mediocre experience in that uh, this is an Anfield Rap show in three parts you might not have noticed but Liverpool didn't play at the weekend that does not stop us the shows keep coming uh, not just this one but everything that we've got behind the paywall uh, this is going to be a show in three parts one uh, the full league transfer picture this window two Liverpool's next two windows in that context uh, and then three the league season from here Josh Williams Neil Jones and John Gibbons to help with all that let's do it let's get stuck in uh, quick quiz gentlemen uh, three teams have bought players uh, one is not to be in this window uh, two have bought in this window and two others have loaned significant first team players that's it that's it um, who are those teams Neil Jones Tottenham have bought Tottenham have bought they yeah. bought the centre half Drag- bought and Werner on loan yeah uh, city to city by the Argentinian kid. lad who's coming next year. Yeah, he's two. Come on, Neil Jones. <sighs> oh, third one. Probably Forrest, doesn't he? It's not Forrest. No, not no, no, Forrest, 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 uh, Forrest like, are nervous. They're, they're the obvious go through them, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, Sheffield United Sheffield United have loaned Brayton Diaz oh. no that's fine you've got yeah. one of the loanees that's fine he's got three John Neil Jones has broke the back of it for you <laughs> yeah. well, well, he did, he did, well yeah or, or, or stole the ones the, uh, the only ones I knew oh, oh know he knows it oh go on John no he's loaned he's loaned Danny Who? it's uh, Burnley with Datro Fafana hey, that, that's four you've got yeah. four who's the fifth it only happened in the last 24 hours god this is exciting <laughs> Josh any ideas no, no, no. nothing no. Uh, Brighton have got a lad from Boca Juniors oh, uh, teenager oh, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. one yeah, yeah, play them as the uh, plays left back or left wing uh, yeah. for them and he's, he's going to be worth about 100 million in, in, yeah, 20, yeah. in 20 yeah. minutes that, that's it that is all the transfer business and I'll come to you first on it Neil Jones we are waiting news of the severity uh, of the Forest and Everton PSR thing that's been briefed in advance by David Ornstein in The Athletic um, it looks to me and it's I think it's inarguable now that PSR not FFP it's now called PSR Profit and Sustainability Rules Profit and Sustainability Rules are here in the Premier League and ultimately ultimately they are now having a massive impact in terms of influence and behaviour there's no argument around it now I don't think no no it, it's um, it's starting to take it took its time hasn't it in, in terms of in terms of the way it is I mean I, I know there's on later on the agenda there's the phrase Wild West and it has felt like that hasn't it a little bit in the Premier League for what I'd five, say, five, ten years. I'd probably. say twenty. I think yeah. you got back to 04. Yeah, I mean, you know, all, all all the biggest spending in any window is always the Premier League, isn't it? Regardless, and you get those stats about Bournemouth have spent more than Serie A or whoever else. Um, so yeah, it looks it looks like a few clubs are obviously the wrong side of the line. I think you'll find even more clubs will be just about the right side of the line, and only because they've had to rein back their their spending. I mean, you look at. For example, in Crystal Palace would be be one of those teams that you know a lot of people have been saying, well, what have they been doing? Why have they not been strengthening their squad? Why have they been doing certain things? Wolves were one, weren't they? That were, you know, a few years ago they were sort of maybe one of the, the teams likely to make that jump to the to the top, and they've been able unable, sorry, to to do that, having to sell players. So it's, it is interesting. I mean, Forest and Everton. I don't know. Are they separated by three points? Maybe about that, in yeah. the league, yeah. Uh, Allowing for Everton's current penalty if yeah, that doesn't yeah, yeah, change absolutely. an appeal. And, and, and in fairness, yeah, that, I mean that, that is a significant asterisk, but that does put them both in real jeopardy, doesn't it? And I think there'll be a few other clubs breathing a big sigh of relief, but also looking at the next the next um, twelve months and thinking we might have to we might have to go through some pain as well. The the key part of it, John. I've sent you all the three of you and I would recommend it to anyone uh, just simply because firstly because it's always a really good piece of work uh, secondly because I think that, that they are currently a really instructive case Swiss Ramble has done uh, Newcastle's accounts this morning uh, we're recording this at 9.40 he put it out at 8 o'clock so I'm not expecting any of you to have read it I forwarded it to all of you but there wasn't much time and there's a lot in there uh, to get through it but what it does and in the Newcastle I think it's really interesting because he keeps quoting people attached to Newcastle yeah. they keep saying we need to sell 
that we're going to need to sell at some point, but then they also say, but all clubs do. And to me, this is the really interesting thing, is that you're in the situation where all clubs do sell, all clubs have sold, all clubs do need to sell. That's literally part of being a football club. But there is going to be a little bit of an issue, because a lot of them could do with selling one to buy two. But if everyone needs to sell one before they can buy two, then who's buying the two because everyone needs to sell one? Do you know what I mean? I think there's a massive logjam here now all of a sudden as this reality sort of dawns. Yeah, I managed to get through most of it actually on the train. Uh, good, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is good, and, and like you say, the, the, almost the most interesting parts uh, are when are when they, when they quote the, the you know the Newcastle execs and stuff like that, and you know, I think there's there's, there's a feeling that that you know Newcastle you know need to get better at selling if you like, but. Like you say, if the if the people who you sell to are, are, are trying to sort of tighten the belts as well, then don't then, then sort of watch you move. And then there's knock on effects for this for other leagues as well. There's there's other leagues in the world that rely on the Premier League Wild West and and what's the sort of you know I mean if fans are shitting themselves basically <laughs> going 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 what have you had Echo saying only three of them are born you know <laughs> and stuff like that and so and so things like that. So there's the the, the knock on, on on effect there. But for Newcastle. You know, we're in it. We're in it. Obviously, a, a situation where they, they had, you know, not a lot of investment for a long time. They've been atrociously run yeah. as, a, as a football club. So um, let's be clear. Uh, yeah, no, they have. And so, the, so the problem that, that I think it's all well and good, or saying well, they need to get better at selling. But if they were they were sat here, they might say, well, well who, who are we selling? <laughs> Basically, because we we had no assets because we didn't. You know, we're you know we're, we're, we're playing them they're, they're sort of on the pitch and, and you see and at the moment you know I watched Newcastle at the weekend and they were great until they weren't and it's because you know it's it's a it's a player depth issue and so even even with the spend you know they still they still you know reliant on a fairly sort of small pool and so so they're finding it difficult but I think everyone needs to find a way because like you've said that this is the reality and I think a few clubs have pretended it hasn't been in a reality and they're the ones who are sort of getting done now. I feel sorry for one or two who who adjusted to the reality and have either been criticised, like Neil's just said, or in, in one or two cases <coughs> went down last year at the expense of others who are who are now bleating. Um, so I feel a bit sorry for them, but I think everyone, you know, is is seemingly now, you know, in the, the transfer window's proof. But the the transfer window is proof, Josh. I think there's two things that are sort of going on at once. One is well, more than two things, but the, you've got this idea that we could do with, a number of clubs could do with selling in order to be able to buy. And the rules, the way in which the rules are staggered in order to be in favour of spend, with the nature of that if you sell, it gets booked all as immediate profit. If you buy, it's spread over the course of the contract. You know, there's loads of ways I want to come on to talk about UEFA in a minute as well, which is which is even tighter than the Premier League. And if clubs are upwardly mobile, they will have to adhere to UEFA's rules, which are tougher than the Premier League's rules. But in real terms, the minute in terms of on the pitch stuff. Clubs might want to sell, but Newcastle is a really good example. Whilst I think they had a really strong first eleven out against City, they didn't have anything much on the bench because they've got an injury crisis of, of the squad players now more than the, the first team players. Liverpool, we can say, have got a bit of a mini injury crisis. You look up and down the league, everyone's got an injury crisis. So it's easy to say, also, do you want to sell some of these boys because we've got an injury crisis? Yeah, but we've got one as well. So you're in the situation where it's 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 where the financial hits the tactical and the, the functional on the one hand, and I just think that you are in a situation where I think almost everyone in the league going, well, we would sell, and you're gonna have to really pay. But then other sides are going, well, we can't afford to really pay because of these rules. But we really could do with another couple of bodies because so many footballers are injured at the minute as well, which is the next phase of this. Yeah, I think I think more and more Premier League clubs have become reliant on other Premier League clubs to buy their play, buy and sell their players, basically. And um, I think more and more it feels like the other top four leagues in Europe have done fewer and fewer business with the Premier League clubs. Um, and it's been it's been like a an in house thing. Whereas now, obviously, everyone's kind of getting a little bit tighter around what they spend and things like that. And it's just resulted in, you know, as you say, just a kind of a, a bit of stagnation where everyone's kind of stood still, waiting for someone to make a big bid for someone, and then everyone will move then on the back of that. But I think Newcastle is a really interesting case too, actually, because uh, you know you say they were that they've been terribly wrong for the past decade and you know I completely agree but when when the new ownership did come in I think they had something like I think it was something like 300 million room to manoeuvre in terms of investments yeah. in the new squad and I think, I think that's, that's what they spent yeah yeah but the, the crucial problem is they spent that to get out of a relegation scrap and then they've, they've got to like where they've got at the minute which is you know you can you can look at their project and suggest that they, they're still ambitious in terms of climbing higher than that but rather than getting higher than that and then being able to sell a star who's maybe outgrown him, like a Coutinho, for example, who went to, to Barcelona, 
Newcastle are still in a position where they want to grow. They haven't really got an overwhelming start in the group, but they're going to probably have to take a step back in terms of selling one of their best players before they really want to, and and probably suffer a little bit of a, de- a bit of a decline maybe in like a season or two um, to kind of suffer that blow and then climb again. Um, so it's interesting because it feels like previous clubs who've gone on this route, like a Chelsea you know, under Abramovich or a, or City under their current ownership. They they got really far in the journey before then having to say okay we'll, try, we'll sell a few now but that Newcastle are going to have to do it earlier in the journey it may, it might make their kind of journey to the top you know a little bit longer it's but in loads of ways though for me Neil I've got a teeny bit of sympathy around that but it's also football like you know you go through Liverpool for instance in this context Liverpool didn't make the Champions League seven years between 2010 and 2020 uh, within that period one year the challenge for the title then they sell the best player. Uh, because that's what happens in football. <laughs> Your best player wants to move on. And then from there they go, and then the same thing happens again. Coutinho goes, but Liverpool that time don't just don't just cope with that. They ride the wave of it instead, and it works a little bit different. You know, this is this is football also. You just have a bad year from time to time, and that's the other you overachieve one year and then you you pay the cost for it the year after. You can make that argument again, Liverpool 2021, 2022, into the season that follows. I think what I think is interesting here is there is a mini clamour that begins to come around changing the rules when this happens to someone like Newcastle without A, acknowledging the knock-on effect of that, but also B, acknowledging that there is a UEFA that's separate to the Premier League and the UEFA's rules are even tighter and are going to get tighter still across the next three or four seasons. Yeah, I suppose it's it's difficult because there's not many neutrals in, in the world, are there? And, and, and people talk about the neutrals quite a lot and they sort of get they get brought into this kind of thing of, oh, if, you know, for the neutrals, wouldn't it be great to see a Newcastle make that step or, a, you know, a, whoever spend the money, Tottenham being back up there. But really, th- there isn't, there's no such thing as, as that. It's, it's everyone's sort of after the same thing, aren't they? You know, and, and everyone everyone has that kind of, Pretty much the same, the same plan. I think Liverpool are a little bit of an outlier in terms of the way they've they've done it for ten, what more years. Um, I think Newcastle's one is interesting because they've actually kind of tried to do it in the right way in terms of the building the squad. But the knock-on effect of that is that when you need to do something like that, I mean, they've absolutely dropped the ball with with Tenali. Obviously, he's a, quite a big, a big sort of again another asterisk in their squad. But they've dropped the uh, sorry. They've what that means is when. As Josh says, they've, they've they've built to get out of a relegation zone. So by definition, the bottom end of their squad are all relegation type players. You know, you look That's at the bench, you look at the bench, Emil Kraft and Paul Dummett and Loris Carrius and Lascelles. Yeah, Jamal Lascelles, of course. Yeah, um, and then they've bought players that are, are very good, and and they've built a good system around them and they've got them working. But when you when you when you take them away and you go, actually, I look at the squad a lot and I go. I'm not having Sean Longstaff as a as a, an elite level player. I'm not having Joe Linton as an elite level player. They're doing really well, and they're, they're doing really well for Newcastle. But you're, you're not looking at them going. If we got them, if we got them, you know, or even even Callum Wilson to a degree, you're like, well, it's Callum Wilson, you know, like yeah, he is he is what he is. There's only really that I'd look at is probably Botman, and Isak and Bruno, the the three, and even them. To be fair, I think Newcastle could sell. Any of those and and go again and not lose too much in terms of their thing, but I think there's probably a, an element of for them. Oh, we we we, we want to be we want to be on this upward curve, you know. They had that amazing sort of um, sort of fuss around returning to the Champions League, and that's been taken away from them very quickly. So I think it's it might be an element of just them swallowing a bit of pride and saying, well, you know, do what do what Chelsea did. Chelsea had Adrian Mutu and. It was the first wave that came in, Adrian Mutu and Wayne Bridge and people like that, and then they go right. Ashley Cole's better than Wayne Bridge, so let's let's go that way. They might need to do a little bit of that sort if, of. Uh, it feels swallowing. like with, with City and Chelsea though, it was just it was constant upgrades for for a long period of time. It, it feels really early for Newcastle to be in this point where they're already having to swallow a bit of their performance in terms of taking a step back for their, for sustainability reasons, and then and then going again. Like a bit, it's going to be a bit of a delay for their project, isn't it? And I think that kind of epitomises this, um, this kind of thing becoming a lot more prominent in the past year or so compared to the past ten years when it really hasn't been looked at at all. The the UEFA reality, John, 
So let's sort of, you know, frame this. UEFA are changing their rules. There's going to be some... Uh, ignore the noise, by the way, around that there's going to be a couple of changes in the way the Premier League do it. Everyone's working this out as they're going. And UEFA are about to change their rules where it's going to be a percentage... Your, your football spend as a percentage of your turnover, year one, 90%, then 80 then 70% by 2025. And that's the challenge, as I say. That By the time you get to 70%, that is tighter than anything the Premier League are doing uh, around this. And if sides want to be successful in the Premier League, it's in part to go and play European football. But you need to therefore be eligible to go and play European football and not basically have one year and then a UA for the government. <laughs> Sorry, we've just looked at the books and your books are an absolute mess compared to... And that's why I think... That, this being a Premier League focused discussion, I think is is a bit daft. I know it it isn't a bit daft if you follow Stoke Everton, but even in Everton's report that they pulled, well, in the in the Premier League report that was pulled together around Everton's first punishment, it said Everton were budgeted them to come sixth. But if you come sixth, you play European football, and if you'd have played European football, you'd have been kicked out, given the the, the nature of where Everton's books are. And I think that thinking of this as this is as much about the Premier League, I think trying to get itself at least slightly closer aligned to UEFA because teams want to play European football, and this is what UEFA wants. Yeah, yeah. It, although Everton are probably thinking, well, they've never kicked anyone else, so they're, not, they're probably not going to start with us. And and so the, I think that's been part of the problem is that you know all the 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 stuff around this has seemed so toothless up till now. Then you know when when they do start coming down, it it has it has been a massive shock to people. And and then there's the thing where you know Everton in in their case, and now Everton and Forest get to go. Well, well, hang on. What what about them? And I'm not unreasonably. I don't think in some cases. And listen, I don't think it's a. It's 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 a, it's never the best arguments in the world, is it? They say, well, well, they were worse than me. It's a bit like in school, but but at the same time, like I saw, you know, there's a couple of people like, you know, tweeting last night saying like they could really do with some communication on this city stuff because it's not great for the Premier League to be in one side going, yeah, we're really tough now, and then handing out witness medals to this team with 115 charges. And, and you know, there was there was plenty of people, you know, saying that last night, and, 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 it, and it's right, isn't it? You know what I mean? It's like, you know, we all get that it's more complicated and we all get that, you know, it's more charges and different charges and the fact that Everton pleaded guilty and blah, blah, blah. But still, as a, we're talking about as an image of a competition here and what they're trying to do and you've got this massive thing overhanging them. It's, it sort of still isn't great, really. I think it, it is going to take some time for all this to kind of fall and, and it to see. Basically, what we want is, what most of us, I think, want to see is, and I think, I mean, Neil's neutral point is, is is a fair one. You know, most of us actually, well, I'm going to say what most of us want is, what most of us want is our teams to win the league. Yeah. But apart from that, <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you try and look at the big picture, like you want, you want a sort of a healthier football and a better football, and, and we'll see and, and we'll see if the sort of leads to a more sustainable, to use their words, football. But, but as soon as I'm here and you say, oh, 70% of your turnover can, can go on, um, on, on, on spend the first thing I honestly think of is well the team with the biggest turnover is going to win the league then every time and, and then how do you how do you get more turnover yeah how do you do it and this is where I've got some sympathy with people who go well, well how, 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 how do you compete then how, how, how do you do it and, and I, I haven't got an answer to that and I think <laughs> I, I think there needs to be the next step where we say, well, okay, well, this is this is sustainability is really really important, and we get that the knock on effect is this, so we're going to try and sort that as well. I think that needs to be the next stage because I don't think it is a big, oh, it's the cartel trying to protect and stuff like that. I just think it's a knock on effect, but it's a pretty shit one. I I, I think the the step potentially is to make clubs look at their academies more, and. I look at what well, this is a knock-on effect. It's not the not. It's not the only but do effect. Start, the, the problem is, though, Neil, is do you start seeing the academy as just somewhere where you make money rather than po- well, yeah, possi- possibly. To, to I mean, I think a lot of clubs already see that, don't they? I, I, I think that's undoubtedly the case. I think, yeah, you know, and but I look at why why are why are clubs stockpiling players more fixtures, bigger schedule, you know, like you say, more injuries, probably more demands on players. So it does it tallies, doesn't it? That you go well. We need to have two internationals in each position. We need to we need to have experienced players. But I think if you if you wanted to sort of condense a little bit of the spending, I think you would you would do it. If you said your match day squad's got to have X amount of players who, okay, maybe not from your academy, but are under twenty one, let's say, or are, are sort of you know trained in in a, a Premier League or, a, or an English English academy. I think it would make a difference because you're looking at. You're looking at clubs now. Some are very good, but you're looking at you're looking at people like Chelsea now. Who, who, that's that's their that's their way, isn't it? That's that's their way around the rules. Is right, Conor Gallagher, captain, 
captain of Chelsea this season. We've got to sell him because he just he's complete. He's complete tick in the box for for finances. I think if you moved it to the point where look, those players are actually important for you. You have to you have to have them to field your match day squad. I think it would make a bit of a difference to the to the turnover. Um, I think there's a way, there's a way to do that with the, with the finances anyway. I think what you should I think what they should do is flip it and say that any <coughs> players who are from your academy don't count. You sell them, it doesn't count. It doesn't do anything for the bottom line in terms of the calculation. But the wages you pay them doesn't count. So they're, they're, they're almost just a free player in amongst your squad. And then that way, you're incentivising this idea of that's how you use the academy players, but you don't get the benefits. If you sell one on because he's suddenly worth 70 million because he's a cracker, you don't get to book 70 million as pure profit. It's actually zero. But if he's worth 100 million and you're paying him 300 grand a week, which, by the way, is, is a significant chunk of change in amongst these calculations, then that's absolutely fine <coughs> because that doesn't count. He, he came through your system. He's your player. He's your prospect. He only counts if he moves to someone else and then they start paying him and they've then got to pay for it. And I think that way you flip the valuation. So suddenly then Conor Gallagher will be one of Chelsea's most important players <laughs> within that mm. within that framework. You want more Conor Gallagher's and you want you want to be bringing less in because they don't cost anything. Uh, and that's. But I think that all the way through, this is always for me on it, Josh. The rules are always one step behind where the reality is because I think everyone always thought, well, football clubs love homegrown players, and we've got other rules around homegrown players. Everyone's always going to love homegrown players, and then what happens is someone works out the diddle on the money, and the rules are one step behind where the where the reality is. And also, what do football fans want? Well, Newcastle fans want to watch Lewis Miley play for Newcastle for, for 20 years. That's what they actually want. They want to feel as though they've got one of their players playing. So you've got to find a way to incentivise that with the money and it's it's going to be difficult. I think the ultimate example for me is, is probably Brighton. I think I do have some sympathy for the clubs that want to climb and, and the, you know, the kind of, the, there's a ceiling being put on what they're doing. But I think Brighton are an example of that's exactly how you do it. That's how you improve gradually year on year in a sustainable way. And it's through ultimately being run in a, in a really smart way. And I think a lot of these clubs in the Premier League over the past couple of years, because of the financial power of the league, it's almost fostered like a lazy approach, I think, to, to recruitment. We can just, you know, we can just buy anybody and um, there's not really a thorough process behind it. Whereas someone like a Brighton, they've got the process in place, they've got the edges in place in terms of where they're looking and that. Every couple of seasons, despite improving, they will sell a little star for about 50 million plus. Helps them balance the books. They've just got Barco in from Boca Juniors. He'll be the next one probably. So it just, I think you can do it if you if you club is 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 run in a smart sustainable way but so many clubs just across Europe but largely the Premier League because because of the interest in it in, in, in a financial sense it's just it's just lazy a lot of it's a lot of the recruitment is lazy and I think it's interesting that um this kind of window has happened now where everyone's really just standing still it's the first window on the back of Everton getting punished and it's it's forced people it's forced clubs almost to maybe look in the mirror and be a bit like right we have to start actually thinking you know you about Manchester United even doing that and you think about Manchester, Manchester United. Manchester United's got the UEFA problem. Yeah, you look at Manchester United's, I mean, you talk about lazy recruitment. Manchester United, <laughs> you talk about being one step behind as well. I think Manchester United are in that. I think they know ev exactly what the trend is for the previous window. You know, that, that's the way they seem to have recruited themselves. <laughs> yeah. it's like everyone needs a, a big, tough hold midfield. It's like, no, that was last year, I mean, like, you need to, we, we, we need we need more technical and, players now. And with a massive turnover, Neil, is what I would say. I think yeah. John's point before, but Manchester United have had to do wasted, half the turn. Exactly. They've the wasted point. money and, and lost money in terms of players. You know, think about the amount of assets that have left for free that, that, were, that were worth... Fifty million pound when United signed them. I mean, I know some of them were out of their control, but they just let Jaden Sancho go on loan. What did they spend on him? You know, they let David De Gea run his contract down after paying him three hundred and fifty grand a week for four years. You know, remarkable, really. What what they've they've done with it. Um, the, the Casemiro deal as well is an interesting Casemiro. one. Yeah. Like oh, they've, they've just realised now. Ah, you know what? Well, that went a good one. That shouldn't have done that. Yeah, I mean, he's, I, he was in Vail before they played Liverpool, uh, and they, they celebrated that like they were one 0 up already before the game. And I remember thinking, I think I was a bit of a mad one, like you know, twenty nine, thirty, sort of seventy million. Five year pounds. deal. Five, years five year, year yeah, contract, yeah. mate. And he wonder why they can't shift players. Yeah, unbelievable. Absolutely. Into Liverpool then, um, John Liverpool sort of don't need to care about rules. I think Liverpool do, uh, on a structural level, very much want there to be rules and regulations. Uh, I think that's always been 
one of the the things that Liverpool's ownership is all about. Uh, that the, the the spending has got to be structured. It puts them at odds with Martin Samuel and the Mayor of Manchester. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I saw this in the agenda and thought you were saying that Martin Samuel was the Mayor of Manchester. <laughs> well, I mean, him and Martin Samuel and the Mayor of Manchester seemingly now have a lot in common. Um, and the Mayor of Manchester all of a sudden will share a platform with anyone. But there Martin is... Samuel might have more time to to do meetings and stuff. Yeah, maybe. yeah, yeah. Maybe he's uh, only got a column a week, I think. Yeah, yeah, maybe. maybe so out the buses and team side. Um, yeah, the, the mayor of Manchester is writing more letters than Hamilton at the moment. It's un- all, all unofficial though, John. <laughs> the mayor of Manchester only writes letters in an unofficial. Oh, oh, culture, yeah. Yeah. I went to see it on Friday. It was good. Yeah. In was Manchester, it? they cheered when the king came on, which I really enjoyed. Did they? Yeah, the city of Manchester. Oh, the king, t- who's the, the baddie in Hamilton, they all cheered when he came on. I tell you what, this what they're about, John. It made me really happy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Did you cheer them cheering? <laughs> well, I, was, I, I, I don't know. It was more of a nice smile. <laughs> well, you know, the mayor of Manchester anyway... Uh, writes letters in unofficial capacities but we'll let him crack on with it he's going to be busy uh, next week or so uh, got them coming out of his ears um, Liverpool uh, don't need to worry about the rules in this instance and a karma market should suit my question now is if the next two windows are going to have this going on as a background surely this is time for Liverpool to put the hammer down a little bit John um, you know my view here is if everyone's going to have to be a bit more rational one Liverpool, not just Liverpool Manchester City have clearly got the experience now of being more rational whether we like it or not but Liverpool are in a position where if rationality is the order of the day and if people who've been adhering for their own reasons I hasten to add to to the PSR rules and they're in a fortunate enough position as Liverpool are commercially then maybe just maybe this is time for Liverpool to to, to press down on the accelerator a little bit I mean that'd be nice I don't think they will I think I think what's what's sort of more likely is that that Liverpool will be able to get more deals done at a price that that they feel is 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 fair, if that makes sense. So I don't think it's it's unlikely from everything we know about the Liverpool and the owners and how they've tried to operate that they suddenly, you know, go into a bit of a, a spending frenzy in January or even in summer and think, oh, we can really sort of get here ahead here. What they'll be probably thinking is those players who who we we've been looking at anyway, who you know people were being unreasonable, we're able to say to them, come on, it's. It's not. It's not that anymore. We're not there anymore. We're not in that market. And suddenly, uh, you know, a defender who they think's worth forty million, say, the, the, the selling club have been asking sixty or seventy at Olden Fire. Suddenly, they've got to start coming to to Liverpool because we're able to say quite reasonably, look, look, those days are over. And I think what Liverpool have always been a bit annoyed about is is other clubs inflating the market effectively, and that's something that. That's why you need the regulation. Yeah, exactly. And it's something that, that, that's ignored by the likes of Martin Samuel. Is that why can't you just let Newcastle do what you want? Is that well, part of the reason is, you know, is, is the fairness and the competitive, but also it fucks it for everyone else. And so, you know, people, you know, you, you, you saw it. Um, you saw it with Everton uh, recently. They, apparently they're saying, well, if, you know, an honor's worth, um, what, you know, a percentage of what Casido's worth. That's what they're they're saying yeah. to Arsenal. Look, if Casido's a hundred million pound player, we're not saying he's quite as good as him, but he's worth seventy. Do you know what I mean? And and that's the that's the conversations that everyone has, you know, on the on the back of these things. And and you sort of get that, you know, really. You it's know, perfectly I, reasonable. Yeah, it is perfectly reasonable. You know, if someone said to you an arm is a seventy million pound player, you'd be like, No, he's not. But if if someone said he's two thirds as good as Casido, you know, that that's a reasonable sort of argument. And so I think where Liverpool will be, you know, enjoying this if if that's the sort of the right way is that I think they'll, they'll be looking at it and thinking we're, we're, we're able to you know to say in negotiations look look the days of, of, of mad spending you need to be more realistic of what you can ask for what these players yeah I think it, it removes some competitors as well doesn't it from the from the agenda you know Liverpool we know they're in the market with you know generally we've seen it you know they had Tottenham United I'm guessing Arsenal would, would, would have been around there there's been some rumours about players with Arsenal Chelsea, of course, probably not City, but Liverpool don't really shop in the same the same stores as yep. City do. There's a lot more sort of. It's interesting. City seems to go either side of where Liverpool are. Yeah, it's, 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 it's similar. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, City will buy a lot of players, you know, Portuguese players and things like that. Alvarez, the new yeah, lad from yeah, Liverpool, yeah. Played. dead but, interesting. But, but it never really feels like Liverpool. Are, uh, yeah. uh, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe Liverpool just sort of as soon as they hear the City trains there, they just think we'll 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 skip that one and we'll go somewhere else. But you think, okay, if United are in at, at, at the limit, I know they've got they're gonna have some um sort of second wind if you like with, with, with Ineos coming in. If you look at 
Um, Chelsea where they're at and they're probably not well I think they're almost certainly not going to get in the Champions League as well so that, that's another another issue um, Pavel through the match real nice <laughs> yeah it's alright um, it maybe just means Liverpool have got a clearer run at certain players you know there's, there's obviously not really much threat from abroad barring the, you know, the, the elite sort of three or four um, Spain and, and, and Bayern Munich but that might be the one that helps helps Liverpool out, and I think also Liverpool have got themselves in a position where they've, you know, they've done it in the way, but they've done they've done the overhaul bit. It's now it's the now it's the tuning bit, isn't it? There's probably one or two players that you'd say, well, okay, yeah, they need to they they need to be signed, but it isn't the case now where you go, it's a big summer this one in terms of you know getting a lot of a lot of work done. It's actually more you can be a bit more picky and choosy. You can, the idea to be a bit more picky and choosy, Josh. I think that this is now where the squad finds itself. You know, I think that they could see if there's something to be done in January, but you do feel a little bit if if there isn't something else that moves, Liverpool might not. But I'm I'm sort of intrigued. I feel as though they've got a really they've ended up with a really really strong base. They've ended up with the, yeah. the idea of a bit of fluidity. You know, could they do with another defender, another midfield, another attacker? I'd argue yes in all three camps, uh, but simultaneously. The type of defender you buy knock on maybe knocks onto the type of midfielder that you might need, which maybe knocks onto the type of forward that you might want. Do you know what I mean? To me, it feels as though Liverpool's base right now to build from is really, really strong, both for this window if something comes up, but also in the summer. Yeah, I think it's quite tricky actually at the minute to, to look at Liverpool's squad and the team and exactly what's needed and exactly what Liverpool are going to do in the next window or something like that. Like I think the, the easy answer is. Liverpool need a six or something like that. But I think Endo in the past couple of weeks has shown himself to be really good. He's, we've just signed him. Um, and he's got, like I think, it's, I don't know, it's a three-year deal or something like that. So I think we've bought time by getting Endo in. And I don't think the six market's very good. I think we've bought time in the sense that we're hoping that the next six emerges in the next couple of years before Endo really falls off a cliff. So I don't think that's an obvious thing in the, in, you know, in the next one or two windows. And, um, you know, the midfield overhaul feels like for the most part it's done. I think the attacking department looks like we've got five real top quality options and if Salah stays, um, I can't see too much change going on in that department either. So you can look look at kind of like a left-footed centre-back or something like that maybe. Um, but overall, I think Liverpool's kind of, you know, squad developments in the transfer market at the minute is, is a little bit open to interpretation at the minute. And um, Looking at the, the, you know, this kind of, shift in, in narrative when it comes to all this sustainability stuff I do think it'll benefit Liverpool in, in the overall in, in comparison to all of their Premier League rivals and that because I think it'll be a little bit like from Liverpool's perspective it'll be a little bit like um, you know welcome to the party lads you know we've been doing this for the, for the past like couple of years we are used to running in this way and, and, and being a sustainable institution and that and I think that's what FSG almost bettered on when they first took over as in like we'll be the best at being the most sustainable and the most successful at once. Um, Liverpool have been really good at doing that and it's, it feels like the likes of Man United, maybe Chelsea, are now going to have to learn how to do that on the fly um, when Liverpool have kind of mastered it, albeit to, you know, it's frustrated supporters in the past because we've, we've you know, reinforced this, this line of almost like, you know, we, we can't really do it or, or it's made us look a bit cheaper in, in certain moments, but... Ultimately, this is this has been why because if you look at the all the sustainability stuff around around the Premier League clubs at the minute, Liverpool have never really had to push that analysis that like you know we we we're on the cusp here we you know we've spent a bit too much or something like that. We've always been like relatively balanced, relatively level, and I think Liverpool are going to benefit from this a little bit. I mean that's what that's what the hope is. It, it is you like you say, Josh FSG have always backed themselves to win a fair fight, and and where they've got cross. <laughs> if that's the, the, the right word, um, <laughs> is is when is when they felt that that's not necessarily the case. So you know yeah. they've, they've pushed you know been, you know the architects are saying things in terms of you know what wanting changes and, and wanting things you know enforced more vigorously and, and, and stuff like that. I'm sure they're all over the, this sort of city thing and stuff like that because I think they think that you know like you were saying about Brighton they, they can run a, a sports team a, in a sort of smart way and obviously it took them a little bit of time and you know made mistakes you know from a purely a sort of sporting point of view here rather than the other stuff you know but but they got to a point where you know a lot of people were saying you know within the industry that you know this is 
you know, one of the best home football clubs in the world, really, in, ter- in terms of how it operates from top to bottom, <clears> in terms of the talent, in terms of the, the people that they've got there, you know, doing, doing the sort of jobs. And, and they, they back themselves to, 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 to thrive in that environment, really. And, and so they, I think, I think they will be, you know, pleased that finally, you know, something is, is happening, but maybe looking at, you know, the, the clubs it is happening to and saying, well, you know, how are Chelsea finding a way around it? And now it, I, I know they're really good at player sales and I know sort of how, the, how they're structuring them, but it, it is, w- w- I think it'll, it'll come to some point where, where would other people start going, well, well this look, look at, looking at Everton and Forest is all well and good, but but what's happening here and is this right? And is that, you know, if people are finding ways around it, it are they the ways that we want people finding ways around it? A lot off the wage bill as well, haven't you? Liverpool in the last 12 months, you know, you look at Milner, Firmino, Keita, Henderson, Fabinho, Fabinho, Chamberlain, Chamberlain, Thiago, Firmino this, this summer. Yeah, you know that's a lot. A lot of money freed up. They, that that we put him in the summer. Is that Liverpool don't Liverpool do one or the other? Liverpool do either the big transfer fee or the big wages. They don't tend to do both. And it was put to me. You know, Declan Rice was an example of one where Liverpool wouldn't get involved in that because the fees okay and the wages are okay, but not both of them. You know, so they're they're more likely to do a a case a, though, who I, I don't think would have been on the same kind of level of, of wage that he was on at, at Brighton um, or they'll do like you say people like McAllister like Sobersly like Endo who are you know you've got some more. big contracts coming up though haven't these you've got, that's what I mean so it gives them some wiggle room for those renewals that, that we need that, that we, we think Liverpool need to do you know Trent Klopp. Trent's the big yeah, one Trent, well, on Salah, the side. Trent Salah Van Dijk <laughs> Klopp, um, Klopp. Yeah. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think they'd Sorry, I don't think they necessarily go up though, would they? So I think Salah, if if we extend Salah, I think it's more or less the same money. Do we agree? Yeah. Like I don't think. Yeah. You it'd be, know, it'd be hard to, imagine, to get it down. Yeah. But, it'd but be hard to imagine them sort of going breaking the back again. For yeah. Salah I think I think if that. Salah if Salah wants to stay and if they, I think we sort of shake hands on the sort of same but, money. I think I think Klopp's probably <laughs> similar-ish. Trent's the one who's going to be. But then you get the next one, don't you? So you get the ones where you want to tie down the the the, the ones who are. Your, your squad, your, your, your new your new look squad. So your Curtis Joneses, your your Canates, your Darwin Nunez, whoever you, whoever you sort of you've, you've, you're banking on and saying right, we're going to build we're going to build the squad around. They become the sort of the ones I've just mentioned there. Don't do the Firmino, the Milner, the the kind of they move into that realm, don't they? As opposed to what they were signed on, maybe. Um, but it does give Liverpool some wiggle room in that. There's, I don't think they could have any excuse of like oh you know. Our sort of our wage bills at the sort of the max. I think it's come down quite significantly. I think on 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 incomings, Neil, either this window or more likely next. I feel a little bit like you can make an argument for anything, mm. but that means that you can make an argument against anything. If you sort of know what I mean, like you could make an argument to go and get an absolute stellar centre half if you wanted one, and then you worry about the knock on effects later on. Two more Champions League games. We've seen the benefit of rotation. I think so far this season we've seen the benefit of a big bench massively this season. I think you can, you know, I think you can maybe look at a continuity move at left back Robertson's not getting any younger yeah. um, you know you can make an argument to do a top quality right back if you could get one because you're going to move Trent into midfield you can make an argument to get a stellar number six but you can make an argument to say no 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 we're happy where we are you can make an argument to buy a number nine and say we're going to use Nunez off the left you can make an argument to get a Salah continuity option and you, I think it's dead interesting that that's where they've got this squad all of a sudden like you can make an argument for absolutely yeah. anything and you could go yep that was the right thing to do after it was done yeah you can make an argument to get a sporting director as well probably to, <laughs> to deal with deal with that Um that's that's the interesting part, isn't it? You'll see, you know, it, it's tough to second guess Liverpool's strategy because I think everyone sort of thought. Do you think there is one? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they're, oh yeah, they'll. I mean, you think it's not just opportun- more opportunism for now? No, I think the player, the, the, the who the player is, will be the opportunity. You know, okay, are they gettable or are they within our, our hitting zone price wise? But yeah, really, you look at the, what are the red flags really at Liverpool? I think left back. Left back is a red flag, just just in terms of age and 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 you know how long the player's been in situ. It's not often you have a player who's at a club, you know, playing at that level, energy intensity for sort of nine, ten years. That'll, you'll be getting towards that with Robertson. I think centre back, in terms of, you're still re- you're still heavily reliant on Van Dijk at centre back, and he is 33. So you have to have that as a sort of it has to be ringed. I think Quan said eases the situation short term definitely, although he's still got a lot. You know, there's, there's got to be a lot of sort of development there for him to, to become a, a an every week player, and then Salah. You know, you still you're still heavily reliant on Salah as as your your main man, aren't you? So, I think I think you'd be looking at strategy, something that alleviates that 
in the long term, but also is is good enough to play in the short term. I think those three areas I think would be obvious. I think for for me in terms of squad planning, you'd ha- you'd have to have those three. I mean, Salah Salah literally at this moment in time is coming towards. You know, he's in the last eighteen months of his contract, so you you have to you have to be considering that. Van Dijk I, I still think Liverpool need a centre back even if even if Van Dijk goes for the next five years I still think Liverpool need one because Canate is still too brittle Gomez is clearly not seen as a centre back for the for the top games and Quantz is 20 and played 15 games but they would be the three obvious areas for me the three obvious areas for you? yeah I think so <laughs> like you say it's interesting to to know sort of what the, what the plan is really for for, for certain players. Well, I mean particularly sort of Trent, you know, in, in his movement. But I think you know you you sort of need some things to sort of to fall in, into place if you like to to help you make decisions on other ones. So okay, well Trent, well, first of all, is he is he definitely going to sign a new deal? I don't think we can guarantee that. I think I think we'd all be surprised if he moved on. But you know these things have happened in football. What does he want? What wages does he want? Um, you know, are, are Liverpool, you know, prepared to sort of go for that? And and also he'll be looking at well, what's your long term plan for me? And, and and does that fit into to what I want from from my football? Listen, I, I still think it's ninety percent sure he stays, but it but but ninety suggests there's a ten percent chance that yeah. that he sort of won't. And, Until and it's done exactly. Until it's done, yeah. And so so I think I think. For me, that needs sort of sorting sooner rather than later, really, both in terms of, okay, well, is he signing a new contract and, and what else is our plan for him? And then, and then, you know, you're not quite sort of building your team around Trent, but but it's not far off, really, in considering, you know... If he moves into midfield, say, yeah. pretty permanently, then it's, you, you're, you're in a situation where you're going, well, we don't need to buy another midfielder. Yeah, you but know, you definitely need to get a right back. But you then probably do need to get a right back unless you're going to go with Gomez and Bradley. That doesn't seem likely, I yeah. don't think. But, you, do you know, so I, that's, that's, that's what you mean, isn't it? It isn't just yeah. the idea of you building it round and, like, he's the main man. Yeah. It's just the idea of, well, the knock-on effect are, and that's what I mean about the base. The players are all there. You add another two or three to them, absolutely brilliant. But yeah. if you do X, then <coughs> X knocks Y on, Y knocks Z but, on, and so but, on. But you could continue with what they're doing. They could, they could continue. Yeah, they could. We're just we're going to have loads of really good footballers who can play in loads of different positions, and we'll change them from week to week. Yeah, you know, that, 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 there is, there is that element to it. You know, I mean, I think I don't think anyone at the start of the season thought, oh yeah, Joe Gomez is sort of you know your your, your left back kind of you know he's going to end up in that position. You're going to have, you know, all of the forwards can play pretty much anywhere across that across the forward line. You know, you don't necessarily have to commit to. We're going to have to get a number nine. It might just be we'll just get a really good footballer in. And then we'll see what who we're playing and who's available, and we'll move him into the Trent. Trent, Trent uh, this has probably been his best half season for what since the title winning season. Yeah, I would I would say, um, and that's been from doing two two or three different roles in in the team. You know that that I think I think there is the possibility. I'm not sure Trent would sort of you'd you'd sell it to Trent that way, but you 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 could sell it with the idea of well, what are you worrying about? Like we're doing great. You're probably going to win. You're going to be in the mix for Player of the Year. You know, PFA Player of the Year doing this right back hybrid role, and we're at the top of the league going for a quadruple. I think the Salah stuff does is is sort of just as big as well, just because of the money what he's on, yeah. and I think you know, obviously, the, the, the quality of the player as well. So you'll need to replace him, but I think you know, Salah. The, obviously, there's there's three options for the for the for the summer, this and it there's yeah. there's one that that they sell him, which I think. Is in a funny way becoming less and less likely. I think he, he was close to leaving last summer, but I think well close as in he, I think I think he it was did, a possibility. He, yeah, it was a possibility. Yeah, I think um, you know I don't think he got that close in terms of you know in, in the end Liverpool just sort of kiboshed it. But Switched I think the phone off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so in. but I think I think it's it's good. I think it's less likely now because of how well we've done this summer and how much he seems to be enjoying this football and being part of this new team. I, but but I think it's it is obviously still a possibility that 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 Salah goes in the summer. Not least it might be it might be in Liverpool's interest if he says, "Well, I'm not signing a new deal." Um, but there's obviously so we might go next summer, or he might sign a new contract, or he might or everyone might just agree that that he that he sort of runs his things out. But if he if he if he does go. Then suddenly you're talking, you know, a, a decent transfer fee. You would have thought, you know, even though he's old and it's a year left, it's still Mo Salah um, and huge wages. And I, th- I mean, he's, I think he's earned some dough over the last few years, Mo Salah. I mean, people talk, you know, they focus a lot on, um, you know, the the 
the baseline and things like that and, and what do we think that is you know somewhere between 300 and 400 grand but you know he's got some great bonuses and he doesn't I was ask, just thinking that yeah, he doesn't yeah. ask for some goals yeah, yeah. And appearance fees every week exactly that? exactly yeah, and I think, so I like, there's, a, there's definitely a reason why he doesn't want to come off pens <laughs> <laughs> and he wants to take pens and he doesn't yeah and he, yeah, he's you charging see, you see like 50 grand to take them <laughs> yeah you see those there's definitely there's definitely a heavy uh, incentivized sort of contract and, and so there was sort of hints to it in that in that interesting half of thing there was sort of you know it, it didn't quite come out and say but it was like I think there's like weeks where he where he's he's making close to a million quid you know what I mean and so and, and so you know that that's like a huge chunk of change. and the reason why I think the Mbappe thing's never completely gone away is that people are like oh we won't we won't we won't do that for Mbappe and stuff like that and and like Neil says I don't think they do the fee and the wage but I think you know when you're talking about Mbappe's wages and if you saw it it would be sort of eye watering but I think if we wrote down how much Mo Salah earns over the last mm. There's no, years. there's no fee either I, as well. I, don't, I think we'd be, I think, so, so I think, so I think that the reason that's not completely gone away is because there, there is the sort of the salad yeah, question yeah. mark. I think the thing is with the salad thing, though, obviously what he's earning and that. The bottom line is he's he's doing a lot of heavy lifting for the modern Liverpool in terms of acquiring points for the team over the yeah. course of a full season. The other player who's doing a lot of heavy lifting is Allison, and the other player for me is Van Dijk. They're the three. They're the three transformers. If he wants, and I think the problem that we've got at the minute, or there the worry maybe is the fact that all three of them are over 30 Trent I think is kind of getting closer to that mould of being a team's a transformer for the team a, a player who's capable of winning points on his own and that but I think the fact that our three difference makers are over 30 now you do have to start bringing in them contingency plans and, and what's next and just getting players who are that special is, is going to be hard it's going to be difficult and um, yeah going back to your opportunistic point as well I think I think the opportunist side of, of what Liverpool are doing recruitment wise does probably lie with a lot of the trend thing to be honest in terms of like you, just watching the market and, and, and as I said before about buying time when you get an end of win you've got a little bit of time with Bradley now as well but I think you're almost watching the market seeing who emerges first a top six or a top right back and whichever one emerges first you can almost move Trent to the vacant spot and then you've got your plan your plan there then in terms of the makeup of the team moving forward but I think a lot of it is opportunistic, to be fair, but I think in terms of the, the, the transformers in the team, them, them three pillars, you have to have some form of strategy with that because that's w- without them, you, you lose a lot of what's made Liverpool great over the past couple of seasons and you lose a lot of the, the 90-point team side of things. OK, uh, we'll move on in a minute or two. We'll talk about the league season from here, but before then, uh, John spoke to Mark King from the Oliver King Foundation. Here it is. It's John Gibbons for the Anfield Wrap and I'm really pleased to be joined in our studio uh, by Mark King from the Oliver King Foundation, who people will have seen, I'm sure, uh, the latest subjects and beneficiaries of the Nivea Men, the Liverpool videos. But before we get into all that, Mark, thanks for coming in. I really appreciate your it's time. It's an absolute pleasure, mate. Any time at all. Any time at all. First of all, tell us a little bit more about, about Oliver. Oh, I thought he was special. He was, he, he was kind, considerate. Not a bad word said about anyone he'd help you. I mean, one of the stories that comes to mind is when he was in school and, you know, they're coming through from the kindergarten to the primary to the infants and juniors and then on to, into the senior school. That's the way the King David works it. And he was he was coming in uh, from year six into year seven, which is the the um, uh, the, the big school, as I call it. And uh, I said, you're going to get battered, you know. You're going to go in here now thinking you're hard. Going on to year six, going into year seven. He said, you're going to be a little fish in a big pond. He said, Dad, you know what? I play footy with all these. They all love me. They all know me. And that's the way he was. And then a couple of weeks in, he came home and he said, Dad, there's a new kid started in our school. And I said, well, go over and introduce yourself. Say, hi, my name's Oliver. And I said, introduce him to your mates so he feels welcome. He only brought some home that night for his tea. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way he was. You know what I mean? Um, and it was great to have him like that. Yeah, I wanted him to be like that. Um, he was a, a natural sportsman. His eye and his hand coordination was there. He had trials at Everton, Liverpool, Blackburn, Bolton, Manchester City, the other Manchester firm. <laughs> Man <United. laughs> um, but you know, he, he was he was a big player. He was a, he was boss footballer. He used to play with Trent in the wow. same team as Trent and that, and they were good. They were they were a good. Um, a good combination, um, but ultimately he wanted to he wanted to be signing for Everton. I said, doesn't matter who you sign for, get out there and just do it as it is. 
Um, he play all weekend football in the Champions League because in the amateur leagues and you know when they come up to 16 from 10 to 16 they have a Champions League at the end of every season and the teams who win the leagues play off together so he's playing for two teams because it's a Saturday team and a Sunday team so the organisers come up to me and said look you can't, you, you, can't, you can't have one game come off and then go, <laughs> go and play for another age group and I'm going well ask him <laughs> You know, but, and, that, and that's the way he was, didn't want to let anyone down. Brilliant. You know, and, and, and he, he was like that, he loved his family, he loved his brother Ben, us, uh, me and Joanne. Um, and and that's, what, that's how he was, he was just, he was there all the time, big part. So he, he obviously loved sports then, very active, uh, but it was that activity and, and, and life that was part of when you, you lost him. Massive, massive uh, sports fan. He could do anything. You know, one of them kids in school who could turn his hand to any sport and everyone's going, oh, is he there again? Well, that was him. Yeah. And he wanted him to play cricket. But he's like, that is not enough. It's, it's not enough for me. And, yeah. and golf and just football or, or rugby or something. Something yeah. with, with a little bit of, you know, he's got to pit him his own strength against someone else and, and get stuck in. I mean, golf, golf was just like, he was like, not for me, that. that. Yeah. And I can understand that because I don't enjoy golf. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, on, on, on the, the 2nd of March is when he passed away, 2011. And that started off like a normal morning. He got up at seven o'clock and he come into our room for what he called his family snuggle. Went and got our Ben, my other son, his younger brother. And we had a family snuggle. And he told me about the mischief he got up to the day before. Please believe me, with our Ollie, there was plenty of that. Um, then half seven, chaos, breakfast done, shirt signed, shoes polished, packed lunch done, sports bag packed. And, you know, away we went to school. But because it, our Ollie is such a dizzy dolly daisy, man, he's like, halfway to school, Dad, I forgot my dinner money. And I, I, I thought, this is a great time to wind him up. So I said, oh, Ollie, I've got no money on me, you know. He goes, you know what? Doesn't matter, Dad. There's Saul, there's James Gow, there's Taylor Moss. I'll get a pound each off them, and you can pay them back tomorrow. <laughs> I said, can I? Yeah. And away we went to school. I went off to work laughing. And 12 o'clock that morning, we got a phone call from the King David to say he's been on a swimming lesson. And his was the first class in the new swimming pool. So he, he was like all excited that morning, getting his trunks and his towel. Um, and we got a phone call to say that uh, uh, a seizure. And to be fair, I didn't know what a seizure was. So I turned to our lads I was working with and I said, look, our Ollie's had another sporting accident. He's on his way to Alderney. I'll go and get him. I'll keep him off for the rest of the day with me and I'll treat him to a McDonald's. And away I went. And I got into Alderay and you know where Alderay is next door is the police station. So I went into the reception in the, in the hospital and I said to the girls, is Oliver King here? And they looked at me blankly for a minute. I said, no, he's on his way in in an ambulance. And I said, okay, I'll wait outside because I know he'll be panicking in that ambulance. About 40 minutes later, I heard the sirens and I'm going, don't be hard Ollie in that ambulance. Be a police car coming in on a blue light, not my Ollie. But sadly for us, it was hard all. Um, they worked on him tirelessly that day. And we lost him. Um, and I couldn't understand why I'd lost a perfect, healthy 12 year old boy in no safer place than school. But, you know, the frustration was there when the crash team were with him. Um, and at one point, I had the doctor by the tie over the bed. I said, listen, if you don't get him back to me, you'll be two minutes behind him. I had to apologise to the doctor, obviously, later on, but it's just that emotion that's there, you just want him. Um, and it was just, from that point, it was just, what's happening? It's like, you're, um, you're dazed. You, you just, I think it was shock, I think. Uh, and... I thought, why? Why is this happening to us? So I looked into what had happened to Harold. And I was absolutely horrified to read that we lose between 12 and 19 young lives a week to this, because uh, it's genetic. So I've got the gene. I didn't know I had the gene until I lost Harold. My other son, Ben, he's got the gene. And he's on beta blockers now. But He's at university, so the cardiologist and his, his uh, tutors in university wanted to have a, a meeting with us. Basically, they said to him, look, you can't party. Like, you, you normally do at university, you know what I mean? But that hasn't stopped him. 
If Glastonbury, the white party, I'd beat that anyway. There's a party, he's in the middle of it. Takes after me. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, we just got to look after him. So it wasn't long before I thought, look, I've got to do something about this. I've got to stop this happening to other parents. So, February 2012, we launched the Oliver King Foundation. And we've got three main aims in the foundation. One is to bring awareness out of this condition. Because people don't know what you're talking about when you're talking about SADS and yeah. you know, sudden arithmetic death syndrome. And there's so many uh, things that come under that one umbrella. Um, long QT and so I'm a doctor now, I've educated myself on this. And uh, I thought, right, that's it, I've got to kick in. So the second one was that like, when the kids reach 14, like every other country across the world, they get a 12 pad ECG. We're 20 years behind this particular field. We're very, very good in this country at treating illness. We're rubbish at preventative. And this is preventative massively. Um, and the third one, that by the time our Ollie was 21, we'd have this legislated, that whenever you see a fire extinguisher in a public building, you'll see a defib above it. I've let him down just a little minute on that. Because he's 25, coming up for 25 now. And but this year, well, in 2023, April 23, we had it passed after 11 years. Five prime ministers, um, team ministers. We met uh, Nadim Zawi, who became education minister. And we went down to London with Jamie Carragher. And within 20 mi minutes of meeting Nadim, he's like, why hasn't this been done before, Mark? And he signed it off, just like that. And I'm like, wow. This could have been done years ago. Yeah. What's the hold up? Mm. So I thought to myself, I'll try my luck here and ask him for a few quid. To, I've never ever asked the government to pay for it. Just do what they've done with the fire extinguisher law. This is a different shout. This is get in. Because there's someone in the old building here in your workplace as a cardiac arrest. You've got four minutes to use a defib. Or their chances of survival drop by 80%. We should all be singing off the same sheet. I'm a not. But I'll get there. One million percent, I'll get there. I've told them down in Parliament, I'll become an MP and I'll do it from the inside out. They won't want me down there, please believe me. <laughs> please believe me. It'd be like Ali G on a scooter <laughs> bombing around Westminster. But I'll, I'll, I'll get this done. Not for me, for my all. Yeah. And for other parents, because as I call my country, Liverpool's my city, I call it mine. It's all mine. So, you know, I've got to work. I can't sit down knowing that, you know, young lives are going to be lost needlessly. Yeah. So we had it passed in April. So January this year, um, no, April 22, sorry. So January 23, we started the rollout. So 23,000 defibs went out to schools. Wow. Across the country. And the government paid for it. And the only reason why that happened was, you're being cheeky and you're asking a little bit. It's worth a no, isn't it? Mm. You can't do anything else but say no. Um, what you've achieved, you know, in just over 10 years is phenomenal. I was reading the, the stats on defibrillators that, that you've put in places, you know, where I go with my lad now and take him to football, there's, yeah. a, there's a thing up there and it says this is here because of the Oliver King Foundation mm -hmm. in, in the school where he plays. And, and so I was I smiled when I saw that last week. I thought I probably walked past that, yeah. you know, 20 times, but because I know you're, you're coming in, I, I've seen it now and that's... That's there, the but yeah, well, isn't it? yeah. The, the training that you've offered, obviously, because people, you know, want to be comfortable in sort of using them, you know, up and down the country, the, the training and the lives saved. I know must be the thing that, that probably means the most to but you. But we've we've actually delivered as a foundation over six thousand, and I've delivered every one of them personally. So I've been as far north as Stornoway and as far south as Portsmouth, and I do it with my mate Dave. He's an ex paramedic for thirty eight years. So when you come into a room. You're looking at 12 candidates, 15, 20 candidates to be trained, and they're all like this. And they're all like the rabbits in the headlights and they're scared to speak. And So I go in and calm things down and I tell them about my all. And then I say, this is Dave. He's been a paramedic for 38 years. He travels the country with me. I see more of him than me missus. So people are relaxing then and start laughing, you know. And I say, that's a good thing because he's better looking. <laughs> when, we, when we have an overnight stay, he goes to the bar without complaining about getting the ailing. So I said, we get on well, we're both Evertonians, so we've got a lot to cry about on a Monday morning. <laughs> um, and that's how we get on. And, you know, it's, we just relax the, the, the candidates who are getting ch in trained. And I think if it's a relaxed atmosphere, they'll take more in. Yeah. And then, you know, the next thing, we're on the floor, Annie's on the floor, the defib's out and everyone's mucking in. 
because I always say to them, look, I'm not going home, so I'm sure you lost the confidence in using this, so if you want to get rid of me, you best get learning. <laughs> <laughs> but it's done on a relaxed level. Yeah. You know? um, and the way I see it is no one's better than anyone else. We're all human beings. Yeah. And we've all got to look after each other. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. You know, I'm sure if I was lying on the floor having a cardiac arrest in the streets, I wouldn't want people to walk past me. I'd want them to have a go. And that's why we do it. Because we wouldn't like to be in that situation and people walk past. So if we bring the awareness out to defibs and on how to use them, it's like we're working with all the day and we're working with the Royal Brompton. There's children there that need to go home and they can't go home because they haven't got a defib. So we step in and give them. Yeah. And we go and train the families because it's a total different mindset if you're working on your own member of your family. Mm. That's what it is. So you've done so much, there's so much more though that you do want to do, you said before you're on a mission and so when, <laughs> when you've got all these ambitions, you know, people like Liverpool Football Club, dear Liverpool, Nivea men, when they step in and say we want to help you, yeah, we want to publicise it more, it must be fantastic. Listen, Nivea men have been fantastic with us, they're, they're so switched on to what we're trying to do, they've helped us along the way. Um, you know, the, the, the lead into that was one of uh, an amateur footballer having a cardiac arrest. Defib saved his life, and uh, Virgil van Dijk went out to meet them and surprised them. And, and I'd seen a few of the videos that Virgil does, and I was just laughing about it. So I was messing about with uh, the, the, the girls from Nivea Men, and I was going, Look, I want Cloppy. You know what I mean? He's got me. I want Cloppy. And, they, and they're like, He's not ready for you, Cloppy. He's not ready for you. <laughs> so, I mean, I was only messing about with them. Obviously, Virgil, boss. Yeah. Absolutely. Fantastic. But the same as Jamie Carragher, you know, we work with the 23 Foundation. Verza was the same. You know, he's a big unit, he's softly spoken, he's, he's just a kind man and he couldn't do enough for us. Yeah. And, you know, we got a pair of his signed boots and, and signed a uh, top um, to, to, to raffle or auction on, on our next dinner. And it's so generous, you know. It it's, seemed to really touch him, like genuinely in the yeah, video. Yeah, it did, yeah. yeah. I mean, it still hurts me when I speak about Arnold uh, and people go, ah, you know, you're out there bouncing about, doing things, helping other people, but when you get home, different ball game. Yeah, yeah. So how can other people help? So presumably when a video like this comes out, lots of people, you know, there's a, there's a real surge in, in interest in what you guys are doing and stuff like that. We've had four million hits. Or, or Liverpool have, and Navy and men, I've had four million hits on the video with me and Virgil, well, Virgil and I. <laughs> um, and, you know, I was thinking, wow, if everyone had viewed it, just donated a pound in yeah. to the foundation, a pound. You know, four million views, a pound each, we're there. It's like when this started, and I read the statistics, statistics, <laughs> um, we, we uh, knew immediately what we had to do, and... You know, we had, we had to get out there and, and make a dent in these statistics, not not sit there and watch them going up. We wanted to, them to come down. Mm. And the only way to do, to do that was get the defibs out there and training, take the awareness out. So when you get a defib, you need all the one from the manufacturers, it comes in the cardboard box. So Ericsson, when he had his cardiac arrest, Mwamba, when they had their cardiac arrest, it was a knee-jerk reaction for people just to get a defib. So when the defib landed in your office or you, you, wherever you were working or the school, people were looking at it going, eh, what do we do now? Does anyone know how to use that? How you get it rescue ready? Oh, Oliver King Foundation. So we were busy. Moving around, training people. and You don't go, oh, well, you're having balls off us, we're not coming. Of course <laughs> we're coming. You know what I mean? Of course yeah. we're coming. And, and, and we're going to show you how to use it now to register it. So it's on the, on the database. And, and, and it's simple. Simple, it's just not rocket science, just a little bit of thought and a little bit of care. That's it. Yeah. That's it. I mean, it's fantastic what you're doing. It's incredible how, you know, over so many years, you know, you've, you've carried on this mission. You know, obviously it's in your lad's name, but there'll be so many people who've you've helped and so many more people who, who you want to help in the future and people who are watching this, you know, as you say, just a small donation. If you enjoyed the Nivea Mendia Liverpool video, just throw in a pound oh, or a bit more if, yeah. you, if you can help and, wow. you know, go on the, people can donate through the website and, yeah. and, and, and get in touch and, and, and just make sure that you can help more people because that's all you want to do. That's all I want to do. We've saved as a foundation, 
Al Ali's name has saved 71 lives. Incredible. The youngest life being four. The most recent life was um, John and another school teacher in um, Southport. He was saying to to all the kids last summer when there was a cardiac arrest. He was having his first shock 24 seconds in. That's what saved his life. Hmm. A defib, early defib. You know, and next venture is we're going to get a centre. And when people have cardiac arrest and heart attacks, it's in here. It's mental as well. Because they're going to sit there and go, well, I was lucky that time. I might not be as lucky next time. I'm not going out. I'm staying in. So you get your doctor saying, there's your diet sheet, there's your exercise plan. See you later. You're not going to go home and get your Netflix on. You just sit there. This is what my ticket. We'll come knocking on the door. Be like one flew over the cuckoo's nest in my van. <laughs> get in. And we'll come to take you to the centre. And we, you can meet like-minded people. You can talk to each other. Get out there, walk and get a bit of fresh air. But most of all, we bring the kids to get a 12 bad ECG test. We won't charge them. Other the companies charge them. They yeah. charge them. Yeah. What are they going to do if I can't pay? <laughs> can't pay, we'll throw you away, we'll leave you. <laughs> Come on then. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we are just there to help everyone. And that's yeah. it. So that's our next venture, the testing centre. But we're also going to have it like a community centre. Look at all the community centres that are closing. And we get the older people who've got nowhere to go of a day. Go, go on, have a cup of coffee and a, and a toasted tea cake with us. And, and get them out again. That's what it is. Yeah. That's the next venture. And I'll get there. I think we all believe him. <laughs> I think we all believe him that he will get there. Listen, Mark, thank you so much uh, for coming in. Thanks uh, for, to the, obviously the Daily Home Living Man for doing the original ven um, video and introducing us. Uh, but they need your help, they want your help. So, uh, Oliver King Foundation, if you can uh, support them a little bit online by either spreading the word or financially, that'd be fantastic. But thanks so much for coming in, mate. Look, thank you for having me here. And look, a, a massive thank you to, to Nivea Men and Liverpool, Virgil, Carragher, boss Carragher. You know, um, <laughs> To everyone that, that, that's part of the foundation, yeah. you are now part of Ollie's army, and there's no getting out. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. Great stuff there, as ever, from John uh, and from Mark. Uh, the league season uh, from here. Um, John Gibbon, the city made crystal clear what this is about. Fuck it, let's concentrate minds. That's what this is about now. Uh, I was almost like, yes, yeah, sound, go on. Uh, the idea of being cowed by it, I couldn't believe. Well, I couldn't believe the defeatism because people are cowards, ultimately. Uh, I was like, come on, let's do this then. That's what you want to do it that way, we'll do it that way as well. We score more late goals than anyone else. Well, that's it, yeah. It's not it's not a million miles away from what we did up there. And, you know, it's, it's, it's Newcastle have a decent side, but the tent, and um, we've beat them home and away this season. So so we need to remember and that. Battered them at Anfield. Well, yeah, we really In did. a comic yeah, manner. Yeah, XG that ends yeah, seven up. 7.3 XG. I'm going to keep, Josh uh, is going to keep talking that, about yeah. it. Every week, mate. Every week. Get, get, uh, put, uh, put, put that on a plane <laughs> over, the, over, over fucking Anfield. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, we do need to sort of keep our heads a bit, um, a little bit with what City did. But, you know, I, 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 I used used the line a few weeks ago. There's the there's the Omar line from the wire, isn't it? It's like wor worrying about worrying about you. It's like worrying about the sun coming up. You know what I mean? It's like they are they're going to be good in the second half of the season. And Kevin De Bruyne was always going to come back, and he's good at footy. And and uh, <laughs> it's a great head of hair now as well. I was going to say way, way, yeah. yeah, it's a great yeah, head of hair. Well, 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 otherwise, if I don't this course, <laughs> I think he's just he's just been growing it in the house, um, and so <laughs> on other places, John. <laughs> <In the house. laughs> <laughs> Under a blue light. Yeah, no, he's, he's got he's got a special chamber where it, where it goes goes better. Um, um, I think we do let injured players go outside. Uh, what's, he, what's he doing in the supermarket? Um, Punch your leg. <laughs> there were people like that with Trent at this fashion thing. Thought he was injured. Um, anyway, so yeah, so City going to be good second half of the season. How good? I'm still not completely convinced. You know, people keep saying, "Oh, City will come back on this and that." Listen, they, they beat. They beat two teams in the bottom four, and then they've and then they beat Newcastle away, and and they, you know a bubble looked a bit sort of vulnerable doing it, and so you know I'm still not quite convinced that they go on this, you know, and they just win every game now, which or they go unbeaten for the rest of the season, not least because they have to come to Anfield by the way, and we're good as well. But 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 I think planning for that in your head and going right sound, well, if, the, if we we know we can do this dance too, I think is 
you know, is is maybe no no bad thing to 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 you know to 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 approach it by. But the next few weeks are interesting because there's a few teams. The our, our fixture list of a, of a mark will be similar, aren't they? Yeah. So I'm thinking, oh, we've got to go to Bournemouth and Brentford, and then they do as well. Like, but both both of us have got to go to Bournemouth and Brentford and Forest. Yeah, we and we lost all three of them games last mm. season, and we're better. But we did lose all three, and so it's going to be an interesting test. But then the test for City as well. City have been beat at Brentford, haven't they? I'm yep. sure. I watched yeah, it. It was on the yeah. telly. Yeah. Beat it all by Brentford last season. They were the only team to beat them twice yeah. last season. And so, so they are. Bournemouth, like Neil says, are the best team in Europe, so they're going to be tough for everyone. And so there's challenges ahead for both teams, and it's and, yeah. and it's who deals with them better. But but we knew that it's not new information. Uh, this idea that City win every game after Christmas, it, it it's happened once. I think in 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 the, the eighteen nineteen season, but they were this time two seasons ago. They were about ten points clear of Liverpool, and 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 Liverpool ended up one point behind. 15, 15 minutes away from winning the league. Yeah, good, they, good no, point. they drew a Palace. There. They lost at home to Spurs. I think um, they they drew at West Ham. You know, so they, they are they're as vulnerable not as vulnerable as anyone else, but they're less vulnerable. They also they are flawed in terms of when when you've got. You, you can't just expect to go on a 20 game winning streak or even a 20 game unbeaten unbeaten run so I think the, I think the big one for me the big spoke in the wheel is that the, the it's at Anfield in March and it's if Liverpool can be in the driving seat when City are coming to Anfield even even in the driving seat to the point where they're only a point behind and a win takes them top that's a big difference maybe Liverpool have had to go to the city in the second half of the season yeah in all of the in all of the years when they've they've been going for the title with them. They've always had that on the agenda that it adds an extra extra scoreboard pressure if you want to call it. Oh, God, yeah, yeah, got to go. You know, might have to go there and win. Can't you know even a draw? They drew two two in a brilliant game. You know, a few years back, but everyone come away and said they had to win that Liverpool. Really had to win that, and it actually so it proved. Even though there was some twists along along the way, so I think if Liverpool can put themselves in a position in March where City are coming, let's let's say Liverpool was were two points ahead still, and a win takes them five in March. Well, you know, I know, I know, I want, I know, I want, uh, or whose camp I want to be in in that one. Yeah, it's, I think the Bruin is is just he, he's a he's a problem. Obviously, I think <laughs> going back to the pillars thing that I've just been touching on there, he's a pillar for them, isn't he? He's like, uh, and I think their their weakness for me is probably I, I want to say on the, on the defensive side there, but they can, I mean, they, they face like eight shots a game, so. Th- they can defend pretty well, but they've looked weak in moments on the defensive side where they can. See, Rodri got his eighth yellow card of the season. Yeah, <laughs> Newcastle. That's a goalie, yeah. a goalie went off injured. So is it ten and he gets a two game? Yeah, that's ten. Two, yeah. He gets a two game ban. So we need two yellows before and that we, field. Yeah, well, no, so, so let me let me let me put the Craig Hannon point to you that he put to me earlier on. Wouldn't you want to just have Rodri at Anfield because we're confident against them anyway? And Rodri misses two other games that aren't Liverpool, where they're even more vulnerable. Okay. Good point. Bit of sauce that for you. Uh, take it away and consider it. So you just had that chat with Craig early. We were recording it off now. <laughs> I know, yeah, me, me Craig, get in. Well, <laughs> I'm in half five. I've been thinking. <laughs> I've looked at this one, you think, Craig? Yeah, yeah. Marked and pushed around it. Uh, where went with the Rodri Yellows? <laughs> Yeah, but it feels like, th- well, obviously with the Bruin and the team, they're, they're going to have the answers to that in the final third. That's where the differences are going to come. They're going to be able to kind of... It feels like that Newcastle game's happened a few times to them this season, but the, the difference is they have the firepower now to just kind of get over the line with the third goal. I and thought it was interesting it was subs. Off the back of what we've been talking about with us, I yeah. thought it was inter- Forget the concept of Big Kev for a minute. I just thought it was interesting that they had, they had a game changer coming off the bench and then they had another one in the young lad who comes on. And I was just struck by all season. You've been talking about this. Guardiola doesn't make many subs. He's not been doing much of this, much of that. Suddenly, it's subs. And I'm absolutely fine with City learning stuff from Liverpool because I think it says that we're going in the right direction as well. And well, I think it was striking to me it was subs. Well, what I thought was interesting, though, did, did you see Guardiola's reaction after the game? Like he was, he was as emotional as I think I've ever seen him outside Anfield. Like um, he looked really like you'd think it was a put it this way: if it was Arteta doing it, he'd have been really criticised for being like too emotional. It's only January, February, mate. You know, it's too early for this sort of thing. But the way in which Guardiola acted after that win, it looked like he was not necessarily feeling the pressure, but kind of aware that like if we're going to make a title charge here, we need to stay within within one result of Liverpool and, and that would have I think put them four or five points behind four, four, something like that yeah. yeah so I, I think Guardiola is, is taking note of, of this this new version of Liverpool and I do think he sees us as a threat I think 
Arsenal feel in every way like the better team and they're currently five points behind us or something like that, four or five points behind us. So I think Guardiola's quietly realised in the past couple of weeks Liverpool are back and Liverpool are once again the biggest challenges to his City team. I think he wants that challenge, I think he needs that challenge, but um, I think he's starting to feel, not not necessarily the pressure, but just just that, that, that he's in a race again. And I think with Arsenal, even though Arsenal held the lead last season, it, it never really felt like a I proper so race, did well. it? I think so. I, I think it's that... I use this a lot in shows so forgive me if you've heard it before but the, the tennis thing of just keep making them make another shot and I think both of them are in that, that mood I think City will think that like City will be thinking Liverpool won't win at Bournemouth that, you know, there's a chance Liverpool won't win at Bournemouth it's off at Bournemouth yeah, it will it will, be. and it will be tough and they'll be thinking that pretty much everyone they play really Liverpool sort of do give you a little bit of a chance, you know. You've seen it even with the Fulham game in the um, yep. in the in the Carabao. They'll be thinking, oh, you know, keep just keep the, the heat on. Don't give them any freebies. And I think Liverpool have to have to have to feel the same. I just take care of your business. Just take care of your business. And I think the the beauty of City in a way is that you can. There's no almost no point looking at the fixture list with City because yeah. you go, they'll probably win. But if you went, do you know what? They've just lost their home to Brentford. There, you know, you go. Mm. Do you know what? That just happens to City sometimes. They just have those games where they go. Out like the same Southampton aren't still out, they, yeah, they, yeah. they used to be yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 and Leicester, Leicester they, they yeah. lose a lot of Leicester didn't they but uh, yeah like that you know you have those games where you watch the first half of a City game and then go out maybe and you go but the City could have been five and look there and then you look at it a bit later and go they got beat 2-1 <laughs> how's that happen you know like they just they've scored off two chances so there's no there's no point sort of almost plotting the fixture list and going they might drop points there Agreed. until you get to the last maybe five games and you go Okay, say they've got Tottenham away or Chelsea away, you go, oh, that's a, that, that is just naturally a tough one. City are as likely to lose points against anyone, but they're, as, they're just as likely to beat anyone, you know, comfortably as well. I completely agree with that. Uh, another Adam Mealy shout. It was no, lovely to see City were involved in a classic, even if they won it. Uh, the more classic City are involved in, the better. As soon as sides <laughs> start getting involved and embroiled in classics, and about, it's about City's fourth or fifth classic of the season. It's mm. worth pointing out. Uh, classics are a danger to you uh, because classics mean it could go either way. Um, other note, uh, I've been banging on to everyone that Cape Verde are better than people think. Uh, big, big, is it Thursday, isn't it? If you just play Ghana, don't be Thursday. That's it's like, it. almost that's, like a knockout. That's, yeah, it's basically, isn't it? Winner takes all. Someone told me Ghana didn't look great. Ghana got beat 2 1 by Cape Verde. Cape Verde are better I mean, than people think, Jonathan. Egypt. Egypt. Egypt were lucky, obviously. I mean, that that was a big that was a big penalty when you look at it, wasn't it? From Salah to, to, to keep them in the, in the hunt. Yeah, could be back. Could be back for. What? Should we be back? 22nd would be the, be be the last, last game, game that'd yeah. be the last game if they went out in the group Chelsea's stage. a big one and get him for Chelsea yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the idea to get a few back for Chelsea I'll come to you first Neil. let's talk about Bournemouth Bournemouth was in, uh, was one of the many Nadias of last season it's also since then <laughs> Liverpool then lost to City uh, next league game back I think it was after the international break they went to City and got beat That's right, uh, yeah. and since then the only time they've lost is the game against Tottenham Hotspur uh, domestically, yeah, yeah. In, in domestically yeah which was the, 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 the going down to nine um, and uh, the referees uh, Making a complete mess of giving Liverpool a goal. Uh, it has everything. It's a shame, one. Yeah, yeah. In hindsight, uh, but also at the time, it's. <laughs> it's uh, Joel, Joel Massive scored the winner as well. I can't get past that. You know, and it was yeah, an own goal in the yeah, 95th yeah. minute. I feel the need to always bring that up. Like, man even match, despite Joel everything. Man of the match, Joel Massive with the winning goal. <laughs> yeah, uh, it had it all. Uh, say what you want. But the point is, is that the, back to this idea of I think Bournemouth are great and they're really impressed last last 10 games or so, worthy of enormous respect. But basically what I'm saying it is Liverpool are worthy of twice as much Liverpool are are um, you know you just got to look at that losses column Liverpool don't lose many games of football yeah yeah I mean they did some did a strange thing last year didn't he they played by Chetich and Elliot I think in midfield and, and looked young <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and, and then the half time went so yeah we, we look a bit young here don't we I don't think they'll make the same mistake again I think you'll see Liverpool a lot more sort of switched on I know it's a different bomb with different manager but it's a game that can trip Liverpool up 100. percent I mean, Bournemouth have been probably the team of the team of the season, haven't they? In terms of against expectations, probably. Um, do, do, do you think that could benefit us though? In terms of like, they've almost moved past yeah, yeah. that the point. Underdog, the of, yeah, I think Liverpool will know now. Like, I feel like a few seasons ago, Sheffield United under Chris Wilder were yeah. kind of a real underdog out of nowhere. But it got to a point where they came to Anfield. I don't know, Christmas time or something Christmas, like that. Yeah, People know we haven't in the bar. I think we beat them three 0 comfortably. I think even if we'd have got them five games ago, it might have been more of a problem now. Just like because because 
Neil talks about them being the story of the season, and I don't disagree with it. But it's after ten games, they were looking like they might do a win of relegation yeah, yeah. battle. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, yeah, yeah. so the, the, it's been two seasons in streaky. one, really. And so, no, but but that, but also the fact that you know, there's there shouldn't be a surprise how good they are now. Do you know what I mean? It's not like I, mean, yeah, I thought they were a bit kind of. Um, you know, unlucky in those first few games because they got a really tough start to them, and then when, even when the games got easier, they struggled to turn it around. But once they've been going, but they've been going for a while now, and so there's there's no for, for Liverpool. You know, you go into a tough place rather Be, than getting caught out. Being there as well, beat them. Um, yeah, in the League Cup, I know it was a, you know much change, but they, they've they've been there and handled Bournemouth. You know, even in, in, in weather, in weather, <laughs> yeah, there was, was definitely was weather that night. Yeah, <laughs> there was famous weather. Um, but they've they've been there, a bit like the you know the, the Fulham elements of, uh, with the two legs. Like yeah, it's almost good you've had you, you've had your little glance at them. They've they've caused you a few problems, but you know you you've got to. There's no excuses for Liverpool. There, there should have been no excuses for them last season. You know they went there, didn't they, on the back of the United seven um, 0 and I knew they'd get beat. <laughs> I, 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 knew, I knew they would. I, I, knew, I, I, knew, I, I, I never really say that about Liverpool. You know, I always have quite a lot of faith in Liverpool. I always think they'll work a game out. Even Arsenal the other week, I sort of thought they might get beat, but I, 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 it didn't surprise me that they won. It would have surprised me that they won at Bournemouth last last season. I think there'll be a lot more, a lot more switched on for it. They've had a little break, even if they don't get many many players back for the game. I still think they've got enough in the in the locker to to go there and 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 play like adults. Looking forward to it? Yeah, well, it'll be a while, won't it? Um, you know, it's it's still sort of, you know, five, six days away. We're going to try and do a live afterwards, aren't we? YouTube live. That's right. Of the post-match pint. Yeah. In yeah. the red line yeah. afterwards. So, so that'll be that'll be good, I'm sure. I'm sure it'll be brilliant. But yeah, it'll be like a nice <laughs> My gap. My as well. I'm hope is it? Yeah, yeah, On the day? On the day. Fucking hell. Huge. No excuses. Get, well, the, 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 they never win on my birthday deal. If you th- ask them what's most concerned yeah, to me, Jan- well, they have bad January's, don't they? Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. They lost the only league, the first league game that they lost under Klopp between Palace and when they lost in the pandemic. Uh, my birthday, literally the day of my birth. Uh, me and Robbie Ryan, a long time listener of the show, uh, they they lose on this day. Was that Burnley? Was it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So ruin ru- 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 my night. Yeah, yeah. My mother, my mother was wondering why I was so distracted, um, <laughs> and, and and there were reasons. What was the one where they were shit at home? Uh, Swansea. That's it. Yeah. yeah went uh, went two 0 down. Got it back to two all through yeah. Firmino, and then when um, let Swansea I make that. it three two. So yeah. when it's time to go birthday, what are we doing? What are we doing? Let's pack in. <laughs> uh, genuine. That's what's funny. Me anyway. Post match pints will be free afterwards, so do check it out on YouTube. Uh, bring cake. Bring your own. <laughs> uh, and go from there wherever you're watching it and uh, move through it was nice to see Spurs and Villa get some hard four points on the road against formerly proud Giants this weekend as well uh, excellent stuff for them uh, I suspect that they are playing for the same position that, that, I was gonna, do you know what that's one of the things that's been ignored hasn't it because we just get so greedy with with the season but you look and go August to get back in the Champions League get right back in there and then you go September the first. Let's win the league. Let's let's have it. And then it's like right quadruples on. <laughs> the more the more the the more the Tottenham the more the Tottenham, <laughs> the Tottenham Arsenal Man United Chelsea Villa the more that they drop points it just it just takes that it, it provides that sort of buffer doesn't it for Liverpool at the very least they're going to be back in the Champions League you know and I know it's not what anyone wants to wear in the sense of oh, you know third's fine but that was the first aim of the season don't lose yeah. sight of that get back in that competition don't. Don't leave yourself in a position where you go, bloody hell, let's tight this league, innit? You know, there's only five points separating the top top six teams. You wanna see you wanna see these kind of results really, don't you? I think I think they were pretty good results for Liverpool over the weekend. We'll do more of that on the weekend later now, which is available for Anfield Web subscribers. Marvellous stuff. Everyone's going well. Uh we'll talk about celebrations as well, I think. That's oh. triggered me as well. So we'll do a bit on celebrations, a bit on top four. It's good doing the show early. What you think? Get your time to you know write yeah. the other shows. I don't know if Josh agrees. He was. He, yeah, he was yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, traffic hell. It's nightmare on the strand. Uh, that's yeah, that's I'm the problem. A, I'm not a morning person. In case anyone's realised. Uh, <laughs> it's been the Anfield Rap. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much indeed to Neil Jones, to John Gibbons, to the Mayor of Manchester, to Josh Williams, to Jordan Singleton uh, for doing the, uh, the the images and Andy Heaton uh, for looking after the audio. I've been Neil Atkinson, and you know what? Football needs to be regulated because if it isn't, it's fucked.